Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are around the world. This is Dr. Nelson Ogunshaki, the CEO of FIDIC. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the FIDIC contract, the gold standard for projects. Uh, it sounds like a very big subject for discussion. I'm really delighted to have so many people within within one minute of open up, we already have 909 people online. Uh, we are expected to be overwhelmed today. Uh, let me just put a, a sort of a disclaimer. Uh, because of the topic, we've expected nearly 4,000 people that register. Our capacity is really 1,000. Uh, to actually address this concern, we've now opened up, we're going live streaming on YouTube. So for those who are trying to get online, who cannot get onto it, because we max out immediately, 1,000 people already on within one minute. Uh, we'll encourage them to go on YouTube and they should be able to get the program live. Um, just to come back into the comments, I think we are so, so delighted to have so many people participating today. Uh, really, uh, we've started the program this year, trying to follow the trend or what the issues are and, and what you think should be the topic for discussion. And really, I'm pleased to say that you know, today's topic is about looking at the FIDI contract and the gold standard we try and put in for project. Is it the gold standard or not? Well, how is industry using it? What are the challenges and how do we address it? Over the last one and a half years, more or less, we've dealt with over 26 webinars, which we've run, and we've had over 20,000 people that register. Today breaks the actually mark that we have 3,960 people register. We've had over 11,000 participants in the program from 150 countries. And invariably, we've got close to 20,000 people that's gone on our YouTube to follow and to watch it on demand, which is incredible uh, from the point of view of FIDIC. And we're delighted to achieve this particular milestone. Over the last 18 months, I think you could ask the question, what are the key messages coming from the industry? Yes, there is a new normal and working practices will not go back to the way it used to be. Uh, communication is key, both internally and externally. The economic impact of COVID-19 will outweigh the last crisis we had in the days of you know, financial crisis. And this is estimated to be between one to two trillion for us to come across that. We are told constantly that investment profile of financiers and government will change. And I like to shift towards housing, healthcare, and environment. This is a major issue for us to consider because this will impact the way the industry is going to respond. Uh, staff and their well being is going to be critical. Uh, because you know, surviving of the consultants and engineering sector is going to be extremely important. Infrastructure in the short term and even in the medium and long term, we need to account for the risk of pandemic and adjust to the condition that we find ourselves. There will be implication for contract. And today we are talking about the gold standard. What does that mean? Is there a challenge for FIDIC and the rest of the world in terms of the contact? And how is the project going to be impacted, delay, the issue about force majeure and other issues that come into it? This is critical. Collaboration and working together as an industry is more important than ever. And then the other concluding comment that came out of so far is that no matter how big or small you are, nobody is immune from the issue about technology change that is going to impact our industry. We've talked about how quickly can we reach the industry, and we've seen example exactly in the way FIDIC is done to actually absorb over 1,000 people to be listening to us right now and having 3,000 people registered. This is extremely incredible. So going forward, what we put on our program this year, we are doing three in one. One, we are showcasing our committees so that we can make them external facing. And so far, so good this year, we have a very successful you know, webinar for our committee. The next one is going to be June 15, and really is going to cover area of net zero. We are also looking at you know, our state of the world and the president, Bill Howard, who you'll be listening to in a minute, has triggered that we must address the issue of state of the world. And we're doing very well on that. Two papers already been published this year, and we are looking to two or three before the end of the year. And we're also picking up the theme from issue about COVID. And today is about looking at the contract as a standalone, the gold standard for the project. And we know that today, because of the level of registration, we need to actually find different technology to enable the participant to be involved. That's why we're doing live streaming. So it goes without saying at this point in time for me to introduce our president, William Howard from United States to share with us 
few words. Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelson, uh, for this uh, for the kind introduction. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Nelson, and the incredibly talented uh, secretariat staff you have for putting on these webinars so successfully. Uh, it would be a challenge under any circumstances to put together uh, webinars on such a variety of subjects over the years, but during a pandemic, it makes it even more challenging. And I'm very pleased with the success that we've had with these webinars. And of course, one of the main reasons the webinars have been so successful is we have managed to attract uh, some of the finest uh, speakers uh, and experts on the various subjects uh, that we present. And we have the same thing today, a number of uh, expert speakers uh, on the subject matter that we will be addressing. As Nelson touched on, um, during the pandemic, FIDIC, uh, through the webinars and other techniques, has really reached out to over 20,000 people, uh, probably more than we've ever been in contact with uh, over the years. And we really hope that the uh, connections that we made with all of these people will continue when we get back to more normal times, uh, as we seem to be uh, getting. As Nelson mentioned, today's subject is uh, fitted contracts, the gold standard. Uh, many professionals throughout the world, when they think of FIDIC, they think of contracts and rightly so. The contracts that uh, FIDIC has been producing for well over 50 years are incredibly important to the profession uh, and everyone practicing in infrastructure, and they're certainly important to us. So today we're going to hear about a bit about the users of our contracts, uh, the agreements that we have with our funding institutions. Uh, but more importantly, we'll, we'll hear about how um, fair the contracts are to everyone, which is our ultimate goal. Uh, every contract that we produce, and we produce them to cover all phases of infrastructure, um, are designed to balance risk properly because we strongly feel that Properly balanced risk is a huge element towards, uh, towards having a good contract. Um, we spend a lot of time producing our contracts and we get the input from a lot of uh, other entities, uh, funding institutions, clients, uh, attorneys, other engineers, contractors, et cetera. And we conclude uh, because of all the effort put in to, to develop these contracts, um, we want to, to uh, absolutely emphasize our conclusion that it's very important uh, not to significantly modify our contracts as much as possible. We all understand that there are local requirements, uh, individual laws, et cetera, that might require some modification to our contracts, but we strongly suggest that, that modifications be handled with caution. For that reason, we produced five very simple uh, golden principles, which we would refer all of you to be familiar with. And basically, our, those golden principles are designed about uh, the, the concept of not modifying the contracts to a, uh, to a, a uh, significant degree. I think all of us would agree that a good contract is not a guarantee for a successful project, but a bad one increases the chances of problems dramatically. And for that reason, I think it's something to have in the back of your mind uh, when you're looking at our contracts and, and thinking about uh, modification. So uh, very important that, uh, that we uh, modify the contracts with caution and stick to those golden principles. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Nelson, and uh, thank you again for the participants and all of our speakers. Thank you very much, Bill, for that uh, very kind welcome you know, speech and giving us uh, the direction uh, from FIDIC president, and I really welcome that. I I'm not quite sure how to put this, Bill, um, and, and to some extent you put me to shame. Uh, we've had so many webinars, I think I've missed one. You haven't missed any. 
uh, and considering it's actually five o'clock or maybe six o'clock now in in uh, in Bolton, uh, and in the sense that you've been able to support us, I'm extremely grateful and thank you very much for your leadership and your support to FIDIC uh, during your presidency. This is extremely extremely appreciated. Now going straight into the particular conversation we're going to have. Now we talked about the FIDIC contract, the gold standard. You may ask the question. Who uses the FIDIC contract? And we thought we should share some news with you. We have private sectors, including the banks and manufacturers who use FIDIC contract. We have various government, including national government and actually NGO that use FIDIC contract. The lists are very much visible. You have international financial institutions from European Bank to African Development Bank to World Bank, all of them using FIDIC contract. You may ask the question, why? Are they using for the contract? Is it because it's the best in town or is it because it's the best available? And is there any scope for improvement? So I thought we should share with you that the uses of the contract is wide and very and actually increasing. Next slide, please. One of the things that I thought is important we share was when I came into office in 2018, we were coming towards the crux of finishing the 1999 version and moving into 2017. And we were asking the bank, where are they? And are they supportive? But I'm pleased to report to you that since 2019, which is exactly six months after I came in, we've been able to secure the World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, the Caribbean Development Bank, European Bank for Development and Reconstruction, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, African Development Bank, Islamic Development Bank, and even IFAD, they've actually signed up to adopt the FIDIC 2017 document, which is incredible in terms of the portfolio of the investment they're putting on. One of the other things that we also consider important is the MOU and the agreement we sign with various organizations around the world, from Philippines to China, for contractors and DRBF to make sure that the FIDIC contract is well used and well in position, including European Investment Bank, which was only signed about two weeks down. Uh, European Investment Bank is quite unusual because they represent the whole of Europe and they cannot be seen to adopt. But actually, they recognize that among all the internationally acceptable contracts, FIDI contract is well known, and they are looking to work with us through our I-5 committees and to make sure that we do a lot with them. Now, that takes me to a lot of the bilateral development bank. KFW, JICA, AFD, and others are very much, and there are other banks who are currently talking to us with the intention to adopt the FIDI contract, which shows that the FIDI contract is truly globally acceptable. Next slide, please. Well, you then find out why is the FIDI contract being used? Now, the bank recently, in my conversation with them, insisted that within a period of three years, we must get the FIDI contract translated into Arabic, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Mandarin. I can report to you that we are four and a half of the languages completed. And we've just got half of that to complete. So we are making progress. But historically, translation has always been to cover the whole of the area. You've seen the list on the spreadsheet. Next slide, please. What you then find out, you're asking today, I am told by Barbara that we've actually broke all the rule today in the sense that we, as at life, when we went live, we have 3,910 people that registered. Are we expecting 3,900? No. Are we expecting 3,900 and plus? to listen to the program today and also to do on a sort of, you know, on demand requirement possibly yet. So what we've done today is that we're actually streaming live because we've already maxed out. The maximum participant is 1,000. We max out right now. And we're expecting other people to join online because of the topic, which is quite interesting. But the other point that comes into that, which is worth deliberating on, we've got 672 people from India that registered. United Arab Emirates, United States, I say the United States, they're here to listen to the president. And also we are from United Kingdom, we've got Ellis Baker, who's from UK, and maybe that's why they're here. But the list continues to go that the participant is truly, truly global. Next slide, please. So what that leads me to is before we start the conversation, I think we ought to start with, have you used or engage with FIDI contract as part of your project. Can I ask you <coughs> to make a vote <coughs> and at this point to submit whether you've actually used or engaged with FIDI contract as part of your project, wherever you are, 
I suspect the limitation we have today is we can only get 1,000 people to participate in this vote. It'd be good to get the feedback before we move into the next stage of the conversation. Barbara, do we have the feedback from the survey? I think we've got 76 percent who have used or engaged with free contract. That is extremely helpful because that gives you an indication of where we are. So I'm going to go into the mainstream. Today, I'm delighted to uh, have within the panel uh, great minds from around the world. Uh, Karen Good from UK. Haron is based in United Arab Emirates. Doduna, our in-house legal counsel. Ellis Baker from White and Case, who is actually based in London. And Pablo Lodin, who is actually based in Madrid. So at this point in time, the setting is very simple. Let me just walk you through how we're going to go forward today. We have roughly about 50 minutes for a direct question to try and tease out a number of questions with all the panelists. And on the hour at 12 o'clock Central European time or one o'clock Central European time, I will open the floor for questions from the floor. I see quite a lot of questions already comment coming through, 57 comment already. So please keep it coming. Uh, but I would suggest it may be a good idea that you actually listen to the debate for the next one hour. And then after that one hour debate, we start picking up questions from the floor. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Karen Gu from you know uh, to introduce herself karen the floor is yours please give us a very quick uh, background on who you are where you are from a little bit insight on your background on philip contract then i've got a few questions to you karen do you want to take the floor well thanks very much nelson um yes my name is karen goff i'm an english barrister practicing from 39 essex chambers in london um, but I'm also qualified in the Caribbean. I have practicing certificates in Jamaica and in Trinidad and Tobago, and I work a lot in the Caribbean. Um, but I'm also a chartered arbitrator, and so I have an international practice as barrister, attorney, arbitrator. I'm a certified adjudicator. So I work all over the world, and of course, um, my main area of practice is construction disputes and uh, ADR related matters. And I have over 35 years of experience in cont contentious construction litigation and arbitration. Many, many disputes are under the FIDIC forms of contract. And um, echoing very much what William just said, the reason for most of those disputes is that people have uh, amended them, amended them too much uh, and upset completely the balance of the contract. So we've ended up with bad contracts, contracts that really don't look much like FIDIC contracts. Um, so really that's who I am. Um, Nelson? Thank you very much, Karen. The last time you and I bumped into each other, I think we were coming from uh, Sao Paulo. And since then, you've been so kind to support us in our FIDIC Contract Users Conference for America last week. So thank you very much. And I'm delighted to have you on board, uh, Karen, again. My first question to you, which is very simple, is it important that FIDIC contract continues to develop and what trend uh, in the marketplace do you see that the FIDIC and stakeholder need to consider going forward? So with your vast experience, is it important that we need to continue to think on what is the trend and what do you think we should be looking at? Karen, the first question to you. Thank you, Nelson. Of course, it's important. You've got to stay ahead of the game. You've got to be on trend all the time. You've got to be out there looking to see what's coming down the track. And if you needed a reason to say that, you only had to look at the last year or so and what's happened to the entire world, which has changed the dynamic of contracting in very, very many ways. Um, what do we need to consider going forward? Well, I think the first thing we need to consider going forward, we really have to look. And I think we need to find our humanity, not just in the way we live, but in our contracting practices. And I think that that is something that FIDIC can be applauded for because it's always been at the forefront of contracting under FIDIC, making a fair and balanced contract. Um, but, you know, oftentimes, and in many parts of the world, that kind of, uh, of thinking is quite alien to commercial people. It, it's adversarial. It's they want to get the best deal they possibly can. And again, as William said in his summary, Getting the best deal you possibly can doesn't mean that you end up with the best contract that you could have. And most importantly, 
it doesn't mean that you will have a successful contract and you will get what you started out looking for. So uh, humanity is at the forefront of many, many things. Sustainability is at the forefront of a lot of thinking also. Suddenly our skies went quiet. There were birds singing again. The world changed and it changed in some respects uh, in a better way. And all of these things, um, the benefits that came in, in terms of um, the world and the way in which we live in the world, I think we have to hang on to those and that will precipitate I think quite a few changes. Um, there are many things that we could do from, um, from my perspective and certainly working in developing countries. Uh, the one thing um, that strikes me with FIDIC is it, it is the gold standard. It is now in its 2017 forms quite prescriptive. And I think this scope within the FIDIC contracts to simplify some of the aspects of them so that they are more user-friendly in the less well-resourced areas of the world. Um, infrastructure continues apace, but oftentimes, and I think the reason why I get involved in FIDIC disputes is, is not because there's something wrong with the basic contract, but there's something that the parties can't deal with when they're working through it. And there are some things that FIDIC could do in that respect. Um, I, I won't go through them now, we've got to talk to everybody, but I'm sure that we will pick up with them in the course of the discussion. Karen, thank you very much for that. I think, you know, it's interesting that you talk about humanity because, you know, we've seen this coming through. And I think in my opening speech, I talked about, you know, the staff, the people, the relationship, the collaborative issues. So I'm really pleased that you really shoot on on this point of humanity and sustainability. The next question I have for you really, of course you advise, and your advice tend to be in the sort of what I call the dispute resolution side, but let's flip the hat. If you've dealt with a lot of disputes in your time, uh, and I'm just asking the question, and I know Bill Sign posted this, when advising client on contract form or FIDI contract, what advice would you give to those considering adopting of them? You know, what advice? Because of course you've spent a lot of time picking up the pieces. What advice to flip you back into that position? You may probably turn around and say, no, if I do that, there won't be any job for the lawyers who are in this resolution. But actually there is opportunity there in the prevention side of it. So the question is, what advice would you give to some of those people who are looking to adopt infinite contract and drafting it? Karen, back to you. The first thing I'd say is read it. Read all of it, in fact. Net, I can see Ellis grinning, but I mean, he and I work because people don't read the contracts that they make. They don't think about what it is they want to achieve at the end of the day. And they get blinkered um, by money and by process, but actually what's the end goal? The end goal is a successful project. And so what do you want? You want a contract that works, that gets you your successful project. And how are you gonna get that? Well, you're not gonna get that by, for example, uh, ignoring the detailed provisions by not understanding the, the role and the function of the engineer properly um, and making sure that you have a good engineer by making sure, uh, when I say good, he's also an independent engineer that you don't appoint as an employer, your in-house engineer. Um, FIDIC 2017 talks about qualifications and things of the engineer. Consider the person that's going to be the engineer uh, and then at least you have a framework for the contract to go forward. And at the other end of the scale, look carefully at the dispute avoidance and dispute resolution provisions. I mean, FIDIC, one of the golden principles is to ensure that DAABs are established and that disputes are channeled through the DAAB. And that is a provision in my experience that is more honored in the breach. Many of the disputes, uh, particularly in developing countries, arise because there is no DAAB or DAB. And, and if there is, they've no idea how to use it. And, and so things uh, fall apart uh, at an early stage often because of that essential failure to understand the contract. But the main thing I would say is do not fiddle with the contract. There is a huge role for lawyers at the transactional stage of the proceedings. Um, when the contract is being formed, bring in your lawyers, go through the contract. If there are necessary amendments to make, make them carefully. Don't destroy the balance of risk. Um, 
So that's what I would tell my clients if they're saying, well, we're thinking about adopting FIDIC. I would say, well, don't fiddle with it. Well, Karen, the point is, I, if I didn't hear the president's speech at the early point, I'd probably say, you know, there's a bit of a conversation going on between you and Bill. <laughs> I think, you know, I mean, I could possibly comment on that. All I would say is that you, you seem to pick up those issues. I, I think, you know, one point that you raised, which I think is what, you know, deliberating a little bit on is the issue about the DAAB. A lot of people don't think about the first A in the DAAB, which is the avoidance. And, and really, I think it's absolutely important. So thank you very much, Karen. I'm gonna come back to you with a few more questions. So going back into uh, the floor and try and pick up, uh, at this point in time, I think he's paid to say, let me introduce Haron, Haron Nezid from uh, HKA. Uh, and I would want uh, Haron to come on board now. Please, can you introduce yourself uh, very quickly? And then I've got two questions so that we can go through this little question around. Haron? Sure. Hi, Nelson. Um, Thank you so much for having me on board. Firstly, I'd like to say to the 22% of people who haven't used FIDIC, you're missing out. So look for it on your next, uh, on your next project. Um, by background, I'm a qualified barrister and went on to qualify as a chartered quantity surveyor. Uh, I'm a testifying quantum expert. I spent seven years working in the magical, I call it magical, kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, and currently based in Dubai, um, regularly in Saudi Arabia, and I'm now responsible for HKA's consulting, uh, advisory, and disputes business in the Middle East region. Now, Karen, thank you very much for that. I thought that I'd bring you to, just to build on the point that Karen talked about. I mean, uh, what my first question to the guy, you know, is very simple. Uh, FIDI contracts are used globally. You talk, you spend some time in Saudi Arabia. I know it's a very interesting market, and I'll bring Ellis in later on because that is one of his haunting grind. Uh, that you know, FIDI contracts are used globally, but the dispute resolution mechanism does not appear to be as effective uh, and preventing issues in Middle East. How could you this be improved? And what you what's your take as you are based in UAE? And I know there are different issues going on. I spent some time working in there. How do we avoid that? How do we make sure, sure the dispute resolution mechanism is put in place properly? particularly in your part of the world. Back it's, to you, Aaron. It's a good question, Nelson. I'm not going to repeat what my, my learned speakers and panelists have said, don't tinker with FIDIC and don't amend the contract clauses, but that is absolutely key. The, the problem here in the Middle East, which is a very dispute-focused uh, market, let's say, from a construction perspective, is not FIDIC. FIDIC's, FIDIC's great. Um, I'd say if I touch on what Karen said, and Karen mentioned humanity, I'd say behaviors is very important and how the parties conduct themselves during the administration of a, of a project. And then I touch on what Mr. President Bill said, um, collaboration is more important than ever. And if you put collaboration and behaviors together, uh, you have a very strong, um, model that needs to be considered when you're looking at why projects go wrong. In a nutshell, what, what would I say? I think projects go wrong uh, here in the Middle East for one, the way the projects are managed. Uh, and I think if I look into a bit more detail, uh, I investigated your question at, at length when I was thinking about it, Nelson. Now we've done a bit of research on over 300 projects that HK has been involved in. Uh, it's called our Crux Research. And Crux looks at the common causes of dispute. And in our 2020 publication, the top three causes of dispute in the Middle East uh, region were number one, change in scope, number two, contract interpretation, and number three was late design information. Now, looking at the background of all of these, these issues, um, I'll touch on change of scope once. And I've got a really good example. We, 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 we were involved, I was involved in a FIDIC Red Book, 1999, major infrastructure project in Saudi Arabia. And the clause 4.1 was amended. For, for all of those who are familiar with the clauses, please don't ask me any more questions. I know about 4.1, but, <laughs> but don't come back with any clause. Therefore, Ellis and Karen. Um, it was amended to, to say, you will design to the extent possible brackets in accordance with best international practice, close brackets. <laughs> what does that mean? Now you had an engineer who was always looking for best international practice when looking for design approvals. 
But the problem was the contractor had a very diff different view of what best international practice was. And three or four very simple words in that clause really caused the parties to reach uh, loggerheads. And I think if you, if you consider what Karen has said, really thinking carefully before you make changes um, is, is critical. And in the Middle East, for whatever reason, we like to make changes. Um, and you find that the bargaining position of the employer and the contractor is a bit different during negotiations. The employer has amended the contract usually, and the contractor usually um, accepts those amendments uh, and takes the view that I will deal with a problem later. Uh, and, and more than likely, as Karen said, they probably many wouldn't have read the contract uh, and the problem becomes a, a big issue for them. I think just, just, just the other thing which I will I'll touch on, I mean, you spoke about the engineer and disputes um, and Karen mentioned, sorry, Karen mentioned choosing an independent engineer, not one from within, within the employer's firm, et cetera. Uh, I think in the Middle East region, again, if we look at the CIDIC in its unbalanced form, again, there is no, there's no issue. As Bill said, the risks have been carefully considered when the document's been, been prepared. But a common problem that we really do see in the Middle East is the role of the engineer. And is the engineer truly impartial even if you have appointed a major local or international engineering consulting firm to take on the role of the engineer. Uh, I think, Nelson, you could probably arrange a debate on its own on this topic, um, but it's, it's, it's such a big, big issue for, for contractors and employers in, in the Middle East. Um, and we tend to find the problem being that the engineer's hands are somewhat tied sometimes, so they don't really have the flexibility and the authority to truly administer the contract um, in the form that it was uh, uh, envisaged when it was prepared. Yeah. Well, I, that's an interesting point because you're building on nicely on what uh, Karen said. I mean, I suspect the other point that's going through my mind, knowing fully your background, uh, Aaron, uh, that you have both a legal mindset and also, you know, practitioner in the construction mindset with also uh, your expertise in quantums and everything that goes with it. So the next question is going to me is, how do you see the Philip contract developing as we move into the digital age in terms of the cost of platform and data that may need to be shared among other people? Will this help? That's the first question, $65 million question. The digital world, should we be moving in that area? And how do you think the Philip contract should be developed in that area? Would it solve the problem in the issue about collaboration and the humanity, or would it compound those issues that you know you and Karen eloquently discussed earlier on? Back to you. Good, good question. I've got two scary words for you, Nelson. Big data. Big data <laughs> is very worrying. Um, we have so much data on construction projects that practitioners really don't know what to do with it. Um, uh, and those working on projects sometimes one don't record it and two if they do record it they don't know where what to do with it um, as a problem will technology help resolve the issue of data uh, i think it will but i think uh, we've got a long way to go in terms of upskilling uh, project delivery teams in relation to the use of technology and i'll give you a very small example bim now has been in the industry for quite some time quite actively used uh, in terms of a data tool for, um, for managing projects, for developing designs, very widely used in the Middle East. But even though you've still got projects with BIM that are uh, in, 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 in dispute and how to manage BIM and who owns the model, who doesn't own the model, um, who pays for the model. We have noticed that in the employer and some, some contracts where the employer is trying to pass the cost risk onto, onto the contractor, uh, and some employers we have noticed are also passing on the risk for different um, ERP systems that are going to be used on a project, passing that cost onto the contractor. So really, at the end of the day, the employer will pay, but through perhaps uh, the bid, and we've seen it priced into prelims and included somewhere in a BOQ as a line item, sometimes even hidden away that 
poor Mr. Contractor has, has missed to price this. And this technology is expensive um, and uh, needs to be carefully considered. I'd just say one more thing, what that one, one thing that we will all need to consider, and I think FIDIC will really need to consider from a, from a, from a, from a drafting perspective, is as we, as we go further down the technology route and the use of data and the use of 3D surveys, digital surveys, uh, sharing of data, the cybersecurity threat uh, remains incredible. Uh, we've seen that during COVID-19. We've seen how um, uh, it's been an opportunity for criminals uh, to prosper. And I think the construction industry is also at risk. So that has to be considered. And there's a big cost that will go with cybersecurity. Um, to the extent that FIDIC looks at balancing risk, as it always does, fairly, um, I, think, I think there'll have to be a consideration as to how to apportion, apportion cost. Well, My worry you. is that it will be passed back to the employer through the contractor, through the usual mechanism, uh, and we don't change our behaviours. Well, you know, Harren, thank you very much for that, because, you know, you've just, you know, given me the right segue to move into Ellis now. I'm, I'm going to actually call Ellis to come on board, because I know you operate in the same space as you, uh, and, and then I'll bring in, uh, Doduna in, and then Pablo try and finish in that order. Now, uh, the reason why I want to bring Ellis in, Ellis, of course, you and I know each other, and we probably, you know, originated from the same part of the world, uh, in Birmingham, as in sunny Birmingham, even though you live in London, I live in Geneva now. Uh, Ellis, would you introduce yourself? Uh, very briefly, and then I've got a couple of questions put across to you. And the reason for that is very simple, because I did talk at the early point that people will remember FIDIC for FIDIC contract only. And I've seen Karen talking about humanity of people in the way contracts docking. I have one or two questions for you, which I really want to put, but Ellis, would you introduce yourself? Floor is yours, and then I'll pick it up with that. Ellis? Uh, thank you very much, Nelson. Um, good morning, good late, good afternoon, or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Ellis Baker. I'm the global head of the construction practice at the law firm White and Case. Uh, my own practice involves all aspects of the delivery of major construction projects around the globe. Uh, I do significant work in respect of contract preparation and negotiation, uh, advice on the making and defending of claims and dispute avoidance and resolution. Uh, many of those projects, of course, involve the, the FIDIC contract, since as we are discussing this morning, FIDIC is, of course, the gold standard for construction projects around the globe. Outside my client work, I am the lead author of the textbook FIDIC Contracts Law and Practice, uh, which provides analysis and commentary on the major contracts published by FIDIC. Ladies and gentlemen, that's who I am. Thank you very much, Ellis. Uh, I mean, just to put that into context, of course, White and Case have a long-standing history with FIDIC, and I just want to put a few questions to you. Uh, and I'm going back to the reference point. I'm going. My reference point is Karen. You know, Karen, you know, have to sort of love me or hate me for this issue. You talk about humanity. The key issue that I have now, you also talked about less and less more people traveling, but still achieving the goal. And the question I was going to put to Ellis is that as construction emphasis switch towards greener projects, greener project. What, in your view, is the benefit of PD contract and how and you know, how many do they need to develop in future to remain the global standard? If we assume and we accept the fact and everybody said it is the gold standard, how do we build sustainability in the way the contract is actually being used? And I know you get involved with both the, what I call the contentious and non-contentious side of the business. What's your take on that subject of sustainability? Hello. Oh, well, thank you very much for that, Nelson. I mean, and I think we are all agreed that um, green projects are is a very important subject and its importance is only going to increase as time moves on. Um, and I would like to think that the FIDIC contracts are already playing uh, a very major role in the delivery of green projects. And I've no doubt that that leading role will continue um, and will expand. Uh, just to give you an example based upon my own experience, for example, if one takes projects the development of wind farms, you know, the archetypal form of green energy, um, I think FIDIC has established itself very early on with a very strong position that many of those projects are being developed under the FIDIC yellow and silver books. I myself am currently working on a project, a wind project, which is being delivered under the silver book. Um, and when, I, when one looks at 
green projects, be they you know, wind projects or sustainable construction more generally. When one looks at those things, um, obviously the ascertainment and the meeting of environmental criteria for those projects, however those criteria might be defined, is obviously an essential part of the delivery of those projects. Um, I do think that FIDIC can, does, and will continue to play a, a leading role in that respect. Um, using my example of the wind farm, for example, um, obviously the FIDIC yellow and silver books are very good at providing a clear delineation of rights and remedies in relation to performance standards. It might be a little example, of course, one thinks in particular about compliance with the employer's requirements and performance guarantees. Similarly, if you look at sustainable construction more broadly, let's just assume we're looking at a sustainably constructed project under the Red Book, for example. Again, one is going to have to look very carefully at what the terms of the specification provides for and what the contractual remedies are under the contract in relation to compliance with that specification. Obviously, when one moves to the future and one has to look at the future in, in this subject, um, no doubt um, the, the, the criteria will develop, no doubt um, the contractual mechanisms for managing those criteria will develop. And it does seem to me that moving forward, one thing that it does have to be astute about is to ensure that its contractual rights and remedies remain are appropriate for the new forms of guarantees, the new forms of criteria that are to be developed. And of course, only time will tell what those appropriate rights and remedies are. But I am convinced that FIDIC today has a very, very strong position in this part of the market and will no doubt continue to do so. Thanks very much, Ellis. I think what you're saying is that we do have the tools within the armory, uh, both yellow book and silver book. In fact, it's interesting that, you know, the contract committee now looking whether they should have a bespoken uh, contract for what I called, you know, the wind farm section. But I will come back to you on that. The other point that I was going to put to you, you know, um, Ellis, which is, is really on top of my agenda, is the 2017 document, and, and I think Karen alluded to the point, again, Karen, you're going to love me after this, uh, you know, it alluded to the point of the DAA be. Uh, what, I, what is coming to my mind is that the PD contract, especially 2017 suit, have a greater provision uh, to avoid dispute. What is in your experience of operating such mechanism in the market? And what do you see as the barrier to adopting the DAAB? Is it one about people don't understand the avoidance element of it? Two, do they consider it to be a cost? Or is it an issue about not having the right people qualify to be able to put that in? Or is it an issue that needs to be addressed at the onset on the project, as Bill talked about? So what's your take, Ellis? Oh, well, thank you very much for that. I mean, that, that's an extremely broad question. And, and I think the point I'd like to start with in answering it is, and I'm looking at this now in the first instance of my contract preparation and negotiation hat. So I'm wearing that hat. So I'm looking at the project at the outset now in the first instance, is that both employers and contractors welcome opportunities for dispute avoidance. I must state that proposition very clearly. Uh, when I'm drafting contracts, I am repeatedly asked to put some form of dispute avoidance mechanism into the contract. Now that dispute avoidance mechanism varies quite a lot from senior officers discussions to mediation and so on. Uh, and certainly, so I think there is a clear appetite in the market from both sides of the industry for dispute avoidance. Um, when one moves into implementation, um, certainly based again on my own experience, I think a lot of problems can get resolved by dialogue at a senior level, or if the differences between the parties can be bridged by mediation. And I say all of that mm. by way of introduction to the DAAB, which is certainly that when the dispute avoidance aspect was increased or have, and one wants to put it in the 2017 forms, that is certainly, certainly from my point of view, I thought that was a very welcome development. 
Now, let me just deal with the barriers that you've alluded to, because there are a number of barriers, and I think one needs to look at those barriers. Um, I think, first of all, one has to accept um, that in some markets, um, there is considerable resistance to adoption of a standing DAAB or standing DAB. And of course, if a board is going to have this dispute avoidance capacity, it really does have to be a standing board. And so one then has to analyze a bit more, well, what is the cause of that resistance? Um, I certainly think there is a perception about cost. I say perception because to me, I think I don't think that really reflects the reality because it's also been very clearly established, of course, that the actual costs of a DAB or a DAAB, a standing board, are very small when one looks at the total project cost. So, but there is certainly a perception about cost and there is a resistance in respect of cost. Um, uh, I also think some people say, well, you know, we've got the, the project managers on both sides. They should be able to resolve disputes in the first instance. So, so I think there are uh, you know, various issues like that that have to be addressed. And of course, you rightly point out to me, too, that there has to also be a significant number of people who are trained and qualified and available to carry out this function. FIDIC having put this in its contracts, then needs to deliver on showing that there are actually people that are trained and able to do that effectively. Um, I think one last point I should also make by way of a question of the barrier is this. Um, when one looks at the contract provisions themselves, they rightly say, of course, that unless the parties agree otherwise, both parties are to be present uh, during dispute avoidance discussions with the DAAB. That's got to be right, of course. Um, but one also, I think, the, the, I think the tensions then come to the fore with the dual role uh, of the DAAB, both with respect to its avoidance function, and then of course, with having to go on and make a binding decision on the dispute, if there is going to be a dispute. And so, when one is obviously in a dispute avoidance phase, um, normally the best way to get things resolved at that stage is for both parties to put all their cards on the table. Uh, and maybe might, they may be reluctant to do that if the board is then going to go on and make a, a, a decision on a dispute in due course arising out of the subject matter. So I think that to a degree may cause some parties to be either less reticent in their what, what they're going to say or concerned about the mechanism. Then of course, one also has to bear in mind the legal framework uh, of the contract itself. And of course, during these um, discussions, however they take place, uh, to some degree, the DAAB will almost inevitably hear things which a decider of a dispute should not hear. And certainly under some legal systems, that then gives rise to a concern as to whether or not the DAAB has stepped away from its impartiality role, and then whether it can then go on and make a binding dispute. So I think there are a number of things that need to be considered, but certainly I for one thought it was a very welcome development when the role of the DAAB was announced in the new forms. Thanks very much, Elise. I think you've dealt with that eloquently. And I, I take your point about welcoming it in principle and the challenges that goes within. I suspect, you know, one of the things we need to look at as an industry is how do we address those perception? Because sometimes perception become reality. So I'm going to move on now swiftly because I'm mindful there's a lot of questions coming from the floor. I'm going to ask people to be extremely patient with me because we have another 15 minutes before we start picking up questions from the floor. So please be patient and let your question keep flowing. I'm not quite sure. I think I'm going to ask Dojuna, if you can be patient with me, Dojuna. And let me bring Pablo in because we seem to be going through market. And I'll bring you in, Dojuna, if that's okay, towards the end. Pablo, would you be kind enough to quickly introduce yourself? And I've got two questions to you before I jump into Dojuna. Pablo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nelson. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, uh, Physic, for allowing me to talk in this event and all the organizers. And thank you to all the attendants. Um, um, my name is Paul Laura, I'm a Spanish lawyer. 
I'm also a fellow of the Chastity Institute of, of Arbitrators, uh, and I used to work for, for a large construction company in Spain, then for an, inter, for an English consultancy, and uh, for more than 20 years I'm running now my own, my own business. Uh, we are specialized in the FIDIC forms uh, all around the world. You know, I, I coordinated the Spanish translation in, of the 1990 versions, so I'm fully aware of the problems that create, you know, translation as Nelson is mentioning, is one of the key elements for the success of the FIDIC around the world, you know, having good translations. Um, and then I dedicate my time, you know, to construction activities, engineering, architects, and of course, FIDIC forms. Thanks very much, you know, Pablo. And that very quick, quick question to you, and I need a quick answer from you. We've heard from, uh, you know, Haron about the tech and the operation in Middle East. We've heard from Ellis in terms of, you know, the challenges and the opportunity that has him. We also had issue of technology, and we had Karen earlier on talking about humanity and how we need to make it uh, more, you know, at least acceptable, particularly in countries that is emerging. Let me spin it now and bring it back to you. In Spain, and particularly in Latin America and Spanish-speaking country, we know the FIDIC contract is widely used in different parts. What, what do you think is the challenges to try and get the uh, FIDIC contract being used across Europe? And how do you think we can improve on the uptake in Spain and in different parts of European country, and possibly to some extent in Latin America? Pablo? Okay, thank you. Now, that, that's a question we, we know making ourselves in the last 20 years. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the first issue is, I mean, you need to convince the users that, that it will be something better than they already have, you know? And then thinking about Spain uh, and Europe, uh, there are many different kind of Europe's, you know, within Europe, you know? North Europe, it's quite common to have standard forms of contract, England, of course, but in South, South Europe, it's not usual, or Eastern Europe. The, the, Daduna, I, I guess we'll talk about that, you know? They, they had to go through a long, long ch big changes on the contracts. So the question is uh, the status quo that is already in, in public procurement mainly, but even in private sectors, I mean, do they need to change it? Do we need to change it? Is it good to change it? So, so, um, so that's, that's the change, that's the approach we have to do as PIDI. Latin America, what happened? Latin America, the investment from the World Bank, Inter American Bank, MCC, as you mentioned, the JICA, uh, it has forced them to use PIDI forms for large contracts. And they have realized that it has been much more efficient than the traditional public procurement rules they have, you know, and there are many examples there. I don't want to, to, to spend time on that now. And that has created a, on, on the construction industry, on the governments, uh, they have realized that it's a much better system than the one they have. Mm. So they are promoting that. And we have some situations, you know, and it's not only using three forms, it's in some parts, but some, Ellis commented about the DAB problems in countries, you know, mm. and we are finding that the Americans and countries are promoting these field boards uh, because they found it, it has helped for the success of those projects. May, they may not use empiric forms, but they're implementing dispute board provisions, which is something interesting. And it, it, it was because they use FIDIC forms and it worked. So how we move it in, in Spain, for example, or in Europe? In Spain, we don't have a standard forms of contracts. So does the industry need that? I mean, I've been listening about that for many years, for more than 20 years, you know, every year. And then, you know, they, oh, well, we need to create a standard. So some, some tips or some suggestions, I mean, Nelson, if I may, you know, there is one thing to do with the politicians, which is the directives, you know, European directives on public procurement, you know. Mm. Um, it comes to a question, it was made to me by a minister in Latin America. I mean, we're, we're about to launch a new construction law. Um, what can we do to use FIDIC? Uh, and I say, okay, that could be interesting. How much time you have? You know, the law is going to be published next month. I say, well, please simply add a provision which says that in addition to the public procurement law, uh, international standard force contract can be used. <laughs> something like that, you know, something short like that, you know. Uh, and that's something if you go to the European directives, it's not that clear. You know, they mentioned that when the project is financed fully by international, yeah. yes, you, they, it can impose. But when it's not fully financed, the, the form contract has to be agreed. Yeah. Uh, and then, the, so, so that's a movement you can think about it. I mean, uh, how to open the door and say it will not apply, or, 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 or the countries can use international recognized standards of, standards of contract just to promote that, which is something that's got done. Uh, for example, uh, I mean, you know, the third is doing it quite properly. It's working very well. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I would recommend to focus on special areas. For example, you know, you, you mentioned wind farms, you know, uh, renewables. There's a huge opportunity there for FIDIC to, to promote the, the contracts. I mean, that sector is very dynamic. It's looking at, uh, and the investors are looking for security and investors coming from all the world, you know. So, so that could be a good mechanism to introduce that. Also, uh, I think the, the private residential development is a good tool. Uh, I think physics sometimes forgets about the architects. Okay. I, don't know, I know we can mix engineers and architects in the same room, 
but I'm talking about building construction. Uh, uh, and so we should promote with it the architecture of things, you know, go for that. Then we have also another idea, which I think the gold book is a, 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 the big forgotten model. I mean, it's the golden book, it, it's completely necessary. Uh, and every time you talk about it, people it gets enthusiastic. And so the gold book should be updated and should be implemented for concessions because it, there will be public concessions, but there will be private construction contracts. And, and, and that will make a very interesting role to do it. Okay. I think also it would be very interesting, if it's not done yet, that FIDIC creates a working group to, to develop, you know, to analyze the European public procurement directives, you know, and, and maybe some local legislation and compare and say, okay, is, is there really any contradiction? I mean, is, is, really, is really the FIDIC form being prevented to use because of the European public procurement or it's simply misunderstanding? I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, for you prejudice, for example, the role of the engineer. No, because FIDIC will, the engineer can do whatever he wants. No, that's not true. No, because the DAB is a moving decision from the from the government. No, that's not true. I mean, so so maybe a working a working group within European and the European International Contract Association, which also very active on this issue, you know, it could be an interesting way to just to at least to have um, as I mean to to to, to break the, the this misunderstanding. Say no, no. I mean, it's completely compatible, or you just have to do minor adjustments, yeah. and it can be well done. Um, so and then. Is misconception, is misconception. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, because it's, it's the same in Latin America. I mean, when they tell you why they don't use it, you say, no, that, that, but that's not that real. Okay. That, that's not real. Yeah. Thank then you. I was, I was going to pick you on that because, I mean, you were involved with the translation of 1999. And I did say at the beginning of the meeting that we've translated the 2017 into Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, and the question I was going to put across to you, do you think this will help to improve that misconception or do you think uh, it won't make any difference? I, my, I, I expect the answer would be a simple yes or no. Is, 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 it, is it yes that we're going in the right direction, Pablo? I didn't understand the question. Can you repeat, please? The question is that, you know, having the 2017 document translated into Spanish and Portuguese, uh, would that help to improve the takeoff and the use in Spanish-speaking countries? Uh, of course, yes. I mean, a uh, strong yes on, on that question. Okay. Thank you. The, the question I was going to put to you, next one really is, uh, my understanding that the FIDI contract tried to minimize or put in place mechanisms to deal with issues before they arise. Which aspect of the contract do you feel highlight this concept best? in terms of how, uh, you know, to deal with issues? If, if, you let, if you let me simplify, I mean, I would say it's the management approach that it takes Good. on the contracts. I, okay. mean, I mean, it's not the legalistic approach. And many lawyers here on, on, the, on, the, on, this, on the screen now, but, but lawyers tend to say, okay, when the problem is there, we'll see how to solve it. And the management will say, I want to avoid the problem or <laughs> I want to solve it before it grows. So I, I think that's all around the FIDIC forms and that's very interesting. And then of course we have the time bar provisions which have been subject to many discussions. But it, it, it benefits a lot because it, it helps to, to discover problems at the early stage, which is a relevant thing. Of course, the advanced warning provisions, you know, uh, now has been developed the new work contract. The termination process by the engineers also helping uh, dialogue the, um, the, the revolutions about the program, you know, and the, and the request to submit a revised program whenever the actual process is not consistent with that. That's also helping to detect why it's not consistent, you know. The, of course, the, the avoidance rules for the DAB, which has been, pro, which been expanded, that, that's very interesting for the DAB to be able to see to the parties, listen, I think there is an issue here. Do you want to talk about it? I mean, I think that's very interesting. Uh, and that's one of the, uh, the, uh, the great things that the DAB may, may give to projects. The subcontractors regulations also has a lot of uh, anticipation. I mean, you have to inform 20 days before commence the work of the site or otherwise. And that helps to say, is there any problem with the subcontractor? And then, for example, the review period by the contractor, the requirements under, under, the, under, the, under the yellow book is also very interesting. The new regulations on the setting out, you know, it's very interesting. Now the contractor has to do it at the beginning uh, to avoid to, to process. So, um, and also, for example, another, another typical discussion, if the contractor receives an instruction under clause 3.3 and he considers it's a variation, he should say it immediately and not wait until one year later to say, by the way, last year you gave me these variations. So, so the, the FIDIC approach uh, of managing the situation, I think is, 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 the, is the answer to your question. I mean, uh, there are many things, but I just highlighted some of them, which I think are very useful tools. Right, thanks very much, Pablo. I've just been informed in addition to 1000 people that is watching live, we have 630 people also on YouTube. 
who are following this conversation. I want to thank you to all those who are participating. Uh, I'm just going to introduce the last panelist before we start taking questions from the floor. It's our Dodina, our legal counsel. Dodina, can you do a very quick introduction? I have two simple questions for you before we start taking questions from the floor. So Dodina, can you give us a little bit about your background and your involvement in FIDIC on this issue? Dodina, very quickly. Thanks, Nelson. Greetings to all the participants. I'm really excited the number of uh, joiners and it, I think it really demonstrates that FIDIC contracts are golden uh, <laughs> standard because of the number of the users. My name is Daduna Gokreidze, I'm FIDIC general counsel um, and my role in FIDIC includes to manage FIDIC contract and legal services. I joined FIDIC over 18 months ago, but I think it seems like 18 years ago with the number of activities going in FIDIC. My background is I'm a construction lawyer. I'm originally from Georgia, and my experience includes working on construction contracts and construction disputes. Previously, I'm a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators as well, and I was the translator of the FIDIC 99 uh, Red Book into a Georgian into Georgian language. I think that's so, about my introduction, Nelson. So do not eighteen months to turn it into eighteen years. You are either telling me I'm working you too hard. Or you are telling the president that the president is driving us so hard that 18 months job is looking at 18 years, or you are enjoying your job in such a way that we are delivering fastly. Either way, it doesn't matter. What really matters is we've got 1,600 people listening to us, and let's make this as exciting as possible. So you've had Karen telling about the humanity. You've had Ellis talking about, you know, yes, the DAB there is there. And I also hear from Haron telling us why challenges and people keep changing things in Middle East. I also hear also <clears throat> from Pablo telling me that yes, language is pretty good, but sometimes conception issue. Can you tell me very quickly the so-called golden principle, which Bill, our president, talked about? Why did we introduce that? And, and what is the benefit of that golden principle? Very quickly, uh, Dodona, what's your take on that subject of golden principle? Thanks, Nelson. A very good question is why? We promote the FIDIC Golden Principles. We set out the five FIDIC Golden Principles that have to be followed and we tell the users, use them. But the real question is why? And I think I have like two, two, two examples to say. At the time when the parties are drafting the contract, what you see most of the time is that the risk allocation that is behind the FIDIC contracts are amended. I think the perception is that the parties try that the more risks they place onto and into another party, they are more protected or they have the rest responsibilities. But I think that the, uh, the reason behind the risk allocation and why it's important is that it has its whole principle behind it. And unless the risk is placed into a party who can bear it, then it becomes difficult to deal with it when, when it eventuates. For, for that reason, it's important to keep the balance risk allocation as they are provided in the FIDIC contracts. Another example is that when the FIDIC contracts are amended in a manner that they are not clear, or they do not take into account the other provisions in the contract, then when the question arises, it becomes the matter of interpretation. Really, what does the contract mean? What is the responsibility of this party or the other party? Who should do what when? And that raised the dispute. So it's important that uh, the contracts are used in a clear, are drafted in clear manner and the risk allocation as provided is, um, is uh, retained in the contract as it is. Also, it mentions the DAB when it's possible under the uh, law governing the contract that the DABs are maintained. And you would see in practice many times that the DAB provisions are not deleted or it just says no DAAB, but no other changes are also made, which is then raise the questions how to deal with the contract. And really the, the DAB is not about the deciding the dispute, it's about avoiding disputes. And Ellis made then mentioned that it's a difference when it's a standing board. It is really when it has the dispute avoidance function. And this is why it is in 2017 that they are the, uh, the standing boards. I think that use, I mean, just to summarize, importance of the golden principles is that it facilitates successful delivery of the project. If you do not follow the golden principles, there is a risk that in the 
during the implementation of the contract, you will face the risk that raise the dispute and it's more difficult to deal with them. Thanks very much, uh, Georgina, for that. I've got one more question for you before we just take a question from the floor. And uh, when I start question, I'll probably start with Karen. So Karen, get yourself revel. Uh, I'm giving you a lot of time to sort of chill and absorb all the comments, all the cross-referencing coming to you, Karen, your humanity, your humanity. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Uh, so let, let's pick up this in Georgina. You, you more or less oversee what's going on in CC. And, and if we're going to maintain the FIDIC contract as the gold standard, what are the things that the CC is looking at now that is looking forward into the future to make sure the gap in the market, we are actually positioning ourselves to deal with that. So what is new? What is exciting? What is in the pipeline? Did you know? Thanks, Delson. <clears throat> I think in order for FIDIC to maintain its gold standard in contracts, there are like two areas to look at. One is where the FIDIC contracts are already existing, just to update them and to take into consideration the feedback from the market and to make it more fit from, for, for future and to reflect on the experience that we learn. And I think in this regard, the FIDIC contracts committee is very busy in updating the existing publications in, I will not go into through details, but including the update on the FIDIC uh, um, uh, Green Book that will be will will see soon. Also, to develop the other forms which supplement the FIDIC suite of contract, which is, for example, the GV agreements for the contractors. When you have those contracts, then you want to know how to use them. And the guidance documents are really there to tell the parties what's the interpretation uh, of the clauses, how they interrelate to each other. And in this respect, the new publications coming up are the um, uh, 2017 guide that will be on all three contracts and a guide on the Emerald book, practitioners use document, which would include the templates documents. This is really to help the users to make best out of the FIDIC contracts and best use. But um, reflecting on your question as well, and Karen mentioned the dynamic in contracting. A FIDIC contracts committee is also uh, looking at the dynamic in contracting and seeing like what other procurement models there are that are uh, interesting for other parts of the world as well, not only in the developing countries or not only in the countries where the international financial institutions provide finance or the funded projects. And in this respect, FIDIC felt that there is a need uh, to develop truly internationalist, international standard form of contract for collaborative contracting, to look at the PPP documentation and develop FIDIC approach on PPP documentation to develop the EPC M form of contract. And um, there is an extensive, extensive work going in the FIDIC Contracts Committee within the task groups to, to develop those initiatives. Thanks very much, Tadina. So I'm coming back to Karen for that. You know, I think it's good to know that we have collaborative PPP and EPCM, which is really other form of contract. And also, I also understand from the doing that, but we're also looking to update the green book and we're looking at you know, the guide to make sure you come back. So if I come back to the question and answer, I'm gonna go across to Karen at this point to give you a quick square. Now, there's a lot of question that is coming through from Flo, Andy, Walker, thank you very much for feeding them. Uh, I'm gonna, start with a caveat to all the question people. If I'm unable to cover all your questions, please forgive me. We do everything that we can to try and cover that. We have 25 minutes to try and give you some space. So if I walk in the reverse order, the first question, FIDIC is the gold standard of construction contract, not least because of the unique role of the engineer. How can FIDIC further protect and elevate the impartial and humane role of the engineer on all projects helping to protect the engineer from pro behavior by the parties and commercial objective of employer paying for the engineer. So Karen, big question to you. How do we actually protect the role of the engineer uh, to play that impartial role and do the job as best as advocated in the Philly contract? That came from Jeremy Mayhew. So what's your take on that, Karen? Yes, I mean, there's an absolutely vital aspect of a successful project is to have an appropriately qualified person as the engineer. So I see it in two ways. First of all, qualifications, an engineer appropriately qualified, technically qualified, um, able to deal with the issues that are going to arise within the contract. And secondly, equally, is um, an impartial engineer. Uh, an engineer that's not tied 
to either party. Now, there are some places in the world, and we heard Haroon talk about what was going on in the Middle East, which we all absolutely know about, but it um, happens equally in other parts of the world. For example, in the Caribbean, uh, everybody knows everybody. So any engineer is gonna be somebody's friend, somebody's colleague. And so to actually achieve that uh, level, re really necessary level of impartiality, yeah, either you have somebody local that everybody says, well, we all know that he's everybody's friends, but he'll be fair because he's all our friend. Or you're going to have to go outside of the Caribbean, beyond the islands and find somebody internationally um, that you will bring in as an engineer. And that is often what has happened. Um, but more often what happens is the employer's person is the engineer and then that balance is destroyed. So I, I think that's important, technical qualifications and impartiality. And then it's actual training and ability. And again, in many parts of the world, training in the FIDIC form of contract administration so that actually the engineer is able to deal with the behavioral issues and, and is able also to bring people together to get them to collaborate. I mean, there's no substitute for good common sense. If you've got the right person, they'll be able to achieve that, but you've got to get everybody in the room. Ellis spoke very well about high level discussions. And I think he and I are on exactly the same page when we're dealing with contracts, fitted contracts or other contracts, we are really focusing these days on dispute avoidance. So you need people in the team on both sides that will engage in high level conversations with or without the engineer. I think the other thing that FIDIC could do, and I'm not sure if this was actually part of your question, but well, I you're welcome, Sir Catherine. I'm listening. <laughs> I said it before. I said it said it when I was commenting on the drafts of the 2017 forms, and I said it because of my work in developing countries that I think actually you could make greater use of mediation. That FIDIC could make greater use because although you have the gold standard and you have your golden principle, let's do it all through the DAAB there are places in the world that are simply never going to buy into that. Okay. And therefore you could do more with mediation. Well, that's a well, that's a well cover uh, point, Karen. I think uh, Doduna is taking on board that question. So uh, dispute avoidance and looking for a various method of alternative dispute resolution, question about technical qualification, impartiality and training. Next question that I have, this is actually to Aaron. Uh, and this is from Khan Haja Hamad. Uh, the question is, why Middle East is drifting away from standard international best practice when FIDIC is growingly considered standard and popular in East and West, North and South? Can you survive in a small village without your brotherly neighbors around? That's a question to Aaron and targeted towards Middle East. What's your take on that, Aaron? That's, uh, that's <laughs> quite a deep question, actually. That's a loaded <laughs> question. That is a loaded question. I think you're the right person for that. What's that's, your take on it? <laughs> It's a very deep question. Can the Middle East survive doing what it wants to do on its own? Well, whilst the market's busy and you have a multi-billion dollar pipeline of projects coming through uh, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, uh, huge infrastructure projects. And if contractors keep bidding, whatever the form of contract, however it's amended, they will continue to be let. Uh, and I think that's the nature of nature of the industry we, we're in. Contractors, um, um, they have a business to run. They need to win work. They need to deliver work. Um, and in the Middle East, we're still seeing a very healthy supply of, of projects. So I think I think it's going to continue, Nelson, very simply. OK, uh, will we leave our neighbors on their own? Possibly. Um, are we worried about our neighbors? Possibly not at the moment because we've got plenty of opportunities for, for contractors and employers, I'd say. Okay, excellent. Thanks very much. I know it's a deep question and we can spend a whole session addressing- Very good question. Yeah, it's, we can address a whole, we'll spend a whole day addressing that. There's a question from YouTube, just to make sure that we are giving some sensitivity to all our participants. This is from the YouTube from Alfonso Pelosi and the question is directed to Nelson. Excellent to have the five golden principle. 
Phoenix should monitor the compliance with the general principle in World Asian European Bank finance contract. Any program for this? The answer to that is we do know which contracts are being used by the banks and we are monitoring that. And we do know that we have set up what I call the IFI committee, which is International Financial Co Committee within uh, FIDIC. The plan is exactly that, to monitor what is happening by the bank and to make sure that you know people are not abusing the contract and hopefully Dotuna and our team will be able to respond on that in the near future. So the question that also come across from uh, is that who is bearing the cost of the DAB or the DAAB? Uh, Ellis, who's bearing the cost? Is it both party or is it one party? Ellis? Well, ultimately it becomes the employer because it becomes a party to the project costs and the, and the employer. So ultimately, it becomes part of the project cost and the, and the employer ultimately bears that cost. So that, that's how the DAB cost is ultimately borne. Um, and, and that goes back to the point that I made, that uh, when we were talking a moment ago about when one looks at the, the cost of the DAAB in the grand scheme of the project cost, it is a very small line item in the project budget. Now, the, I understand with the new World Bank uh, imposition on uh, the DAAB, I don't know how far, and please don't quote me on this, and maybe Dodjuna can correct me. My understanding is that the bank, particularly the World Bank, where they uh, extend the role of the DAB uh, to look at the gender abuse on site, that they may cover you know, part of that. I mean, Dodjuna, is that a fair point? Dodjuna, are you still with us? Nelson. Yes. Yes, I think that the approach is to take it into the project costs and provide finance for the employer's part of the, the DAB uh, of the DAB cost. Uh, I think that's the, that that is correct if I'm not wrong. But as uh, as Alice mentioned, I mean, uh, practically and legally speaking, it's a split between the employer and the contractor. Mm -hmm. But as Alice mentioned, because if it's a a part of the project cost, and because the employer is the, the funding the, the project, then it becomes the, the employer's. Right. Obviously, it seems that the whole idea of introducing the avoidance in the DAB and making the standing uh, has created a lot of question from the floor. There's another question on the same subject of DAB, and I probably will probably have to put it across into uh, most likely be Ellis or Karen. Uh, the question from Victor Pira, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Is it mandatory to be in any way certified for serving as a DAAB? Can a knowledge and experience in construction management, project management, work supervision, and contract management be counted for being assigned or accepted as DAAB? So who wants to take that? Pablo, or is it going to be Ellis? Pablo, let me put it across to you. Do you need to have a certified qualification to be DAAB appointed? Can you unmute this, Pablo? Yeah, no, actually you don't, it's not mandatory in the contract, but uh, of course it's highly recommended. Uh, um, and then FIDIC is doing a big effort now. There is not, uh, currently at this moment, you know, the, this new process for accrediting new adjudicators. There are some worldwide associations which are doing hard work as a discourse in World Foundation. We've done a, a, big, a big work in Latin America, for example, we run many, many training events there uh, and all worldwide. So uh, the question will be, it's not mandatory now, uh, but it's highly recommended because it's not the same being a high uh, professional, good engineer, great lawyer, great arbitrator. That's not the same as serving as, as this board member. It's a completely different animal. It's a completely different tool. So people, has, people have to learn how to do it. And as, the same as arbitration, the dispute board process will be as good as the dispute board members are. So take care of what who you choose for the role. <laughs> Thank you. I think the comment you say in there, Pablo, uh, is uh, buyers beware. Once there's no regulation to say you must be certified, it's always good to get somebody certified. Just let me put a plug in. Uh, Pablo talked about some of the initiatives that FIDIC is putting in. We set up in March this year the FIDIC Credentialing Limited, which was set up to expand a list of our certification uh, process. Uh, and the top on the list is the issue of adjudicators. 
uh, which fit on people on the president list. And Bill has been pretty busy this year appointing people as a result of this what happened within the industry. Let me put a caveat on it. My understanding of the contract, because when I was talking to the bank uh, about 12 months ago, there was a perception that, you know, because the DAB is engendered within the contract that the appointment must be made by FIDIC only. That is wrong. The parties can identify people who they feel is qualified to preside over the issue to be appointed as a DAB or DAAB. My understanding is correct by saying that it's only when the two parties fail to find a mutual agreement and appointment of that candidate can they refer the matter to the president list for appointment. Currently, we have 70 people on the president list, uh, but we're being charged by the banks to increase that to 700. So we are working hard on it. And I can report to you that the first cohorts, you know, had the exam and the results will be out by the end of this week. So we are looking to increase the list of people who are on the president list. And we want to make sure that we have people from different parts of the world and have more gender balance into it. And from people from Africa, from Middle East, from Asia and Latin America. And now that we've got the translation, into Chinese, which we actually launched this week of all the 2017 document. We've got the translation in Portuguese and Spanish, which will help to increase the number of people from those particular parts of the world uh, to be qualified and to be on the president list. So I do believe that progress is being made, but in answer to your original question, you do not have to be, but buyers beware. As Pablo said, they need to be trained in how to preside over the issue they need to have legal mindset, they need to have technical mindset, and they need to have quantum mindset. So you need to get the right people to preside to help you with that particular area. One question is coming from the floor, and I'll probably put this to Ellis, because uh, Ellis talked about sustainability earlier on. It's a, and I think it's from a guy called Steven Van Kooch. And so what do you think of the use of FIDIC contract in the offshore wind construction business? And will it be something FIDIC is considering to add to the rainbow suit? Uh, Ellis, what's your take on that? Should... Well, <laughs> what's your take? I, I certainly think that one of the uh, areas that FIDIC might want to consider for doing a new form of contract would be an offshore wind contract. Um, and just to explain why I say that is obviously if you look at the the FIDIC forms as they currently stand, understandably enough, they are all prepared with onshore works in mind. Um, but one has to accept that there are significantly different risks in the offshore construction industry, such as waiting on weather, how you deal with the various vessels that are going to uh, you know, build, be involved in the building of the offshore works. And so I do think that, you know, specifically with respect to the offshore wind sector, but also the offshore sector more broadly, I think it would be extremely useful um, if FIDIC were to prepare such a form of contract. Well, Ellis, I'm going to come to you because we started looking at the offshore wind contract. And that contract is in the final phase. So I may probably need you to help us to close up on where we are on that. So that's the answer to that question. Uh, there are a few questions coming through from a gentle person called Kirill. He said, what if the golden principles are violated? To whom should be addressed the issue? Or if requested or contract has been the assumption the golden principles are violated, who can decide whether they are violated or not? Uh, so Doduna, is a question to you or to Karen? Karen, I think I'm going to put you on the plug. Karen, what do you think? Who should we report to if the golden principle are violated? Is there any, any grant? That depends, she said in her best loyally voice. It depends entirely what's written in the contract. Um, the golden principles are inherent in all the provisions of the contract, um, but some golden prin principles could be violated without actually constituting a breach of the terms of the contract itself. So, you know, it depends. Um, Ellis or I would have to read the contract or, you know, and have to read the contract and look at all the terms to see actually whether there is an actionable breach which would give some remedy for, um, uh, for the person against whom, <laughs> whom the uh, breach has taken place. So I'm sorry, there's not a nice clear answer, but there really isn't. 
<laughs> well, I think the, the principal, Bill, maybe I should bring Bill into the point on this, you know, uh, because this is, sounds like it, it, one of principle. My understanding is that, and I think the donor said it quite clearly, that it changed the balance because in preparing the document, uh, you will look at the risk allocation and then you said, if you start messing about with these, you know, clauses, you have the probability of changing the balance and there will be a consequential issue down the line. So, Bill, what's your take on it? Well, um, first of all, I, I mentioned FIDIC's role. <clears throat> we cannot do much more than educate and advise and uh, create things like FIDIC principles. We obviously have no authority uh, over um, um, the, the owner of, uh, of a construction project, and, and nor should we. Um, so what we can really do is provide advice and guidance and, ca and caution owners um, that the consequences of violating these golden principles, they may feel like, oh my goodness, I've just transferred all the risk to someone else. In our experience, it increases by orders of magnitude that that is going to come right back uh, towards the end of a project and everyone's going to regret that massive transfer of risk, just, just actually one element. And the DAAB, I mean, a lot of the golden principles to me just make common sense. I think as, uh, as uh, we heard earlier from, from one of the panelists, I forget, I think the, the word common sense was, was made. But um, other than advising and, and, and educating um, it really is in the end up to the owner. And um, we, we absolutely know there are some horrible problems going on in, in infrastructure uh, activities all over the, uh, the planet. And a lot of them are based on uh, unbalanced risk that just causes all sorts of problems. So uh, I think it, I could probably go on and on for. Uh, thanks very much, Bill. On, Bill, thank you very much. I'm going to use that to be a close because I'm getting prompt from Barbara to say we got five minutes to try and wrap up. Now I, I'm just going to give my panelists uh, a sort of a, a one sentence strap line. Today's topic is FIDE contract is the standard that we print is the gold standard worldwide. So I'm going to start with Karen. What do we need to do to maintain that standard and to even build on that? The same sentence, the same question goes to all the panelists because Bill's already told us that we've spent a lot of time is a common sense issue of not to abuse the contract. And I think if there's one thing that Bill will leave us with, that's a fantastic one. Let me compliment it with Karen and others. So Karen, if we're going to maintain the standard and make it what it is, the gold standard, what do we need to do to keep our journey over and above the humanity aspect that we started off with? I think I'll end where I started, which is you need to stay ahead. You need to stay ahead of the competition. And I think broadly speaking, you are ahead of the competition. You have a really good suite of contracts in the rainbow suite, but I see there is scope for development. You've spoken about wind farm. I think, uh, for example, if you wanted to make FIDIC more widely used in the UK, you might look at doing something like and not just the UK, but in other systems where they have statutory adjudication systems, which actually presents a conflict. If you're going to compete with people like the NEC and the JCT, then you could actually produce supplements to your contract. I think you could have supplements also to deal with big data, certainly for BIM, um, as I say, for statutory adjudication, not just in the UK, but in parts of Asia, there are statutory adjudication schemes. There are lots of things that actually you could still do. Uh, and I think it all goes to staying ahead of the competition because fundamentally you have a very good, well-balanced suite of contracts. Thank you very much. Thanks for that closing statement. Uh, Ellis, what's your takeaway? My takeaway is of course, the FIDIC contracts as they stand are excellent forms of contract. Um, in order to continue to prosper, the FIDIC forms of contract need to be responsive to and to continue to serve the needs of the market. And I'm sure that FIDIC will rise to that challenge in the years to come. Thank you very much. Harun, apart from looking around the neighbors and what's happening around the neighbors in the Middle East, what else do we need to do? 
I'd say, um, Nelson, it's not the standard, it's the tried and tested standard. So I'd say in the Middle East, uh, really looking for more training, more awareness, uh, particularly to those responsible for uh, amending the standard form, which we see so heavily done. Uh, there's nothing wrong with amending. Um, the golden principles envisage it, but do so in the right manner to respect the golden principles. Uh, and I'd say just lastly, touching on Karen's point of humanity and the issue of behaviours, really thinking carefully in, in any future editions, how the behavioural element can really be incorporated into provisions. Uh, and, and not only by using terms such as fairness, et cetera, which, which, which may exist, but really thinking deeply about, about behaviours and conduct. Thank That's you it very from much. Nelson. Thank you. Pablo, uh, what's your takeaway? One statement you know, to, to close out for us. Okay, I will just follow what, what Karen mentioned, uh, what I suggested also before you know. Yes, uh, we don't need to amend, we may need to complement sometimes. Uh, and first, uh, provide guidance about to, to avoid these misunderstandings, you know, these, these fears of the people is empiric. I mean, uh, try, try, try to make, explain the people that the fears are wrong. Um, I mean, especially for public procurement. And second, giving guidance, which may be sometimes complementing, not amending, but complementing. Uh, already, Felix is working on the BIM issue. Uh, I saw a comment on, on, the, on the chat. Uh, and that could be a, a tool, as Karen mentioned. I mean, if, if we have a statutory education, we can complement uh, already ready for it. If we are, have some decennial law, we can have already a specific package just to put, I mean, just change this if we have this. So we, we can be working on that because automatically it will help the Felix to be used. And that automatically will help the feeling will be will be proven. You know, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pablo. Then the dinner I've come to you. You've listened to all the panelists. We're gonna do a takeaway. So I'm not gonna ask you to summarize. So what are the one sentence that you pick up from today that we need to do? Apart from being ahead of the competition, which is Karen and being humane, what else we need to do? Nelson, what we need to do is to, to reflect on the market needs and dynamics, as I've mentioned. And I would like to use this opportunity just to address the participants, our users of the contract, to invite them to engage with feedback so that we have uh, engage with feedback so that we have feedback, we reflect on them, and then we take that into consideration in our future updates. This is really, really important for us to, this is how we could improve and develop further. Thank you very much. I know I've got the right person at my legal counsel, uh, which is listen, uh, reflect, feedback, and work and engage. So that is absolutely fantastic. Now, I know we run out of time. Can I just start by saying this has been absolutely phenomenal. This is the first time we've actually had a max out on our webinar. Uh, there's two polls that I really want to put before the crowd disappear off. Our first one is following this webinar, please rate on a scale of one to five your answer of the Philly contract. Easy, one, good, and um, poor, a uh, five is very, very good. So how would you rate, you know, the Philly contract, you know, following this webinar, please rate on a scale of one to five your answer on Philly contract. One is poor and five is very good. So I hear 43% said very good and 36% said good. If you add the two together, that takes you to close to 80%. That rests for me. The next question is following this webinar, please rate on a scale of one to five, your awareness uh, of the FIDE contract, uh, see that the golden standard you know, stand. So what is the view? Comment on scale of one to five. Please time to vote. So please rate on scale of one to five, what extent FIDE contract set the golden standard for project? Five is to great extent. Please time to vote. Barbara, do we have the result? Again, we have 40% of good and actually yes to great extent of 32, that take us close to over 70%. And we've got 21%, which is actually looking about purely good. So on this point, I'm just going to really close out. Uh, we're running out of time. And uh, once again, we've got over 800 people still live. Uh, what can I say? We've got our three webinar program going. One is the FIDI committee webinar, which will continue next is on the 15th of June. We have the state of the world coming to 22nd of July, and we're going to do more of the Filipino uh, webinar coming through in the near future. So please, for those who are able or, or unable to watch this, uh, there is an opportunity to go on the YouTube and watch it. We have an opportunity to do a deep dive 
on FIDIC contract by going to Asia and Australasia conference, which is coming up in July on the 12th, 13, 14, and 15. And likewise, we have Europe, Middle East, and Africa conference on the 29th, 31st, and 2nd of November stroke December. For those who came to the conference today and this particular program, if you use a special code, you will get 50%, 15% discount, and you are highly welcome to register as soon as possible. Now, let me try and wrap up and finish up. Uh, we've set up a new official contract users linking group which will give us an opportunity to get engaged. That's what Dojuna said, engage and feedback. We now have the opportunity to engage all the FIDI contract users to join us on the official FIDI contract user LinkedIn by scamming on the system and please join us as soon as you can. We want to engage, we want to pick up feedback, we want to improve. We want to make the FIDI contract to be the best that is possible and we can only do that with your support. So on that note, without further ado, I want to thank Bill for his time once again in supporting us. I want to thank Karen for her you know, eloquent start in the way we started the program. And I always go with Ellis as well, and Aaron and Pablo, and also Doduna for your contribution to the conference. I always went to this program. At the same time, I want to say a massive thank you to Barbara and the rest of the team who are working hard to make sure this particular webinar has been successful. Perhaps this is the best webinar that we've had with over 1,000 online, plus 600 on YouTube, and have 3,000 people that register. So all the panelists, can I say massive thank you to you for your time, for your contribution, and trust me, we will be back. Whoever you are, wherever you are as the participant, my golden statement at this point is be safe and stay blessed where you are.